Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench we have some calibration fixtures for the 7000 series scopes. I've been getting a lot of questions in email about these particular fixtures, what they are, what can we do with them, do I need them. Um, so in this video I'm going to try to demystify what these are doing, how I'm using them during the calibration pro uh, and alignment process, and do you actually need them or do you not actually need them? And as always with most of this stuff, the answer always boils down to, well, it depends. So we'll start off with, do you actually need a calibration fixture to work on a 7000 series scope? The answer is no, you don't. But you do lose one of the powers of a 7000 series scope. So you can do the full alignment on a 7000 series with, um, and this is true for all of the 7000 series except possibly the 7854. Um, you can do a full alignment frame and everything with a time base and a vertical plug-in and things like that. So we'll use the 7603 that I use as a daily driver as an example. I could align this scope with these plug-ins and that'll be just fine. The measurements will be valid. Everything will be good. It'll meet spec. All of that stuff that's good. The problem is, or the limitation, not really the problem, you lock the plug-ins to the bays because there's a, in the signal path of the scope, you have the signal path of the plug-in to the signal path of the frame to the output of the, of the screen. As you're doing the compensations and things like that, especially the high frequency compensations, you're aligning the plug-in and the frame to each other. It'll meet spec, all the waveforms will look good, but the plugins will be locked into their frame. You can't pull this plugin out and plug it in over here. You may have a completely different response curve. And and a lot of the manuals, especially some of the 76 series, call that out. They say, yeah, it's perfectly okay. You do not need one of these signal standardizers to do a um, an alignment, but um, don't move the plugins after that. Align it with those plugins and then lock them in there and leave it and consider it a a unit. The other thing, so what the signal standardizers and plugins are actually doing is standardizing the response of the individual bays. So if I pull this out and move this over, the bays are within a tolerance where this is still giving me valid measurements because the response between the two ports is standardized and roughly the same uh, because they were aligned with the same signal. Obviously this is off, so I can move these around all day. Now, the other problem is if you don't use one of the signal standardizers, every time you move a plug-in, like if I wanted to move this over and use it in the 7854 or even this 7904A, the alignment on this plug-in is matched to this port, may not be matched to this port. So I'm not guaranteed it's in spec even if I take the plug-in and move it to another scope because they're kind of locked together and, and married together. So to keep the movability around, the bays have to be standardized. That's where these guys come in. So this is my complement in the lab of signal standardizers and plugins. I have two of the dash zero ones and I have one of the dash zero twos. Main difference between the two main difference between them is speed. I did end up there there's a funny connector on one, so I ended up getting the connector. Now the plug-in does a couple of features or does a couple of things that are important during the alignment and calibration process is it generates some um, very specific waveforms, fast edges, a couple of things like that, helps out immensely with the uh, geometry alignment with the tube, especially if you have two of them. If you have two of them, you can put one in a um, one in a uh, vertical bay, one in a horizontal bay, and you can make a dot matrix pattern on the tube, and that very much helps with an alignment. I'll show that a little bit later in the video. Dash zero two is good for anything in the 77 series and under for sure. You can really d use them for the 7854 
and maybe even the 7904. It's pushing it on the 7904. The 79s and the 71 scopes are what the uh, Dash Zero 2 is um, designed for. They're the 1 gigahertz frames. So I used both of these for the 7904A when I checked it in. And I know the um, service manual calls for both of these for the 7854. So we'll be we'll be using the two of those. That's actually why I had to get the, the faster plug-in. Every once in a while you can catch these on the secondary market. Um, they are not inexpensive. But there's not a lot that goes wrong with them either. They kind of either work or they don't. They have the typical cam switch disease and a few other things. This one in particular, you have to be really careful with, and I'll get into that here in a little bit too, um, when we take a look at some of these. But as you can see, so it has a um, common mode. Then we have some gain. Uh, we have uh, vertical or horizontal step responses. These are used very often in the alignment of the... Um, of the bays because you're doing, um, you're essentially peaking the response of the, of the individual sockets. But then this also does some triggering response and things like that too. And uh, the only difference between the dash zero one and the dash zero zero is the rep rates. Uh, this has faster rep rates and faster edges. The other thing that's really important on this is when you do the frequency response of the vertical or horizontal ports, you, uh, this actually does the leveling feature. So you, you plumb a um, SG503 or an SG504 into here, and this does the leveling. Uh, CW is carrier wave leveled. And this uh, makes sure you can do the bandwidth check on the port itself without a vertical plug-in in the way. So you're getting the full bandwidth of the port in the frame, not taking into account the vertical bandwidth of the 7A plug-in that, that you might be using. So I did check this into the lab, so I do know this one's working. Um, I did this back in 2018, it looks like. Um, good news is there's not much there there's very few adjustments if if any I don't even remember if there's any adjustments in here they they either kind of work or they don't and uh, this one worked okay if there's interest in what it takes to check one of these in let me know I do need to check in this other one so there is things we have to do but here's the inside of one of these and as you can see we have the Tektronics cam switches of course but a distinct lack of um, adjustment points, so which is good news on these. So if you get one that's working, it's most likely going to meet spec out of the box. Uh, should be checked, but because nothing's guaranteed, but it should. Um, this uh, I've had a couple where this coupler has busted. Um, I don't remember which one of these had that problem, but I did have to repair this. The other side, pull the covers off. There's a couple of adjustments on there, but not many, and as you can see, cam switches everywhere. So that is essentially what makes up one of these. So very nice units, but not much them. However critical for working on some of these older units. Now we're getting into the fast one. This one's kind of cool. I've been in this one before, but I looked at it. And now we have some problems. Not really problems, but um, this is the switch pack on this one. Now you'll notice there's a bunch of cautions on here and it says remove with care. Because this is for aligning the 7104, 7103, and the 7900 series, these are, these are higher than a gigahertz plugins, as you can see with the hybrids along here. 
uh, these do suffer from elastomer problems. Um, I do find myself using the Dash Zero Twos much more, much more often in the lab, but I don't have a 71 series scope. Um, unless there's a ton of interest on the channel, I probably won't get one due to the fact that they use a microchannel plate CRT. And just by the nature, they're, they're wonderful devices, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying they're terrible or anything, but just by the nature of what they are, their lifespan is limited. Um, the microchannel plate was needed to get the brightness um, for single shot events on a one gigahertz waveform, but um, it does kind of torture the tube a little bit. So it is what it is. So personally, I'm topping the lab out at the 500 megahertz at the 7904, unless there's channel interest. This plugin is also needed to calibrate the, or to align the DSAs and the 11,000 series scopes. I believe this is, this is used also for those. These don't come up very often, but um, so if you're looking for one when they do, you may have to jump on it. If this has been taken, disassembled completely, um, there was a special alignment jig needed to align the elastomer contacts in here from Tektronix. It is an absolute nightmare to get this realigned. The manual calls that out five or six times. Don't take this full thing apart. Watch how many screws you take out because you take out all the screws. It'll shift and then it'll, it'll be a nightmare to get it lined back up. So be careful with that. Um, also, because these are the elastomer contacts, be careful with whatever cleaners you use under here. This one I'm still using um, isopropyl alcohol only. Haven't tried anything else, but I also haven't needed to. So um, on the back side of this, all the fun stuff I think is on the front. That's where all the high speed circuitry is. Uh, I guess this fits in a TM series frame. But uh, somebody called this out. Apparently, uh, I don't know if this was a somebody made the mistake where this was. Uh, did this come from General Electric? That looks like a GE. That might be a GE label. Um, but there's the cam switch for the elastomer down there. some high speed stuff there's probably a hybrid on the other side of that but uh yeah so there's not much to these but very critical pieces of equipment and as you can see not many adjustments so we got we only have four five yeah five one two there's a cap there so there's some R there's a rc pair there got a pot there a pot there and a pot there and that's it that's all the adjustments there are on there. So not much to go wrong with them other than the usual dirty contacts and things like that. Okay, what kind of waveforms do we get out of this thing? There we go. Zoom in on that a little bit. So as you can see for step response, um, The uh, response is very sharp. That's for... Aha, there's part of my problem. There we go. Set the triggering right. So we're at one nanosecond per division. Obviously, there's no readout for the vertical because we're on uh, here, but it can do a positive going step response and a negative going step response. Um, but as we can see, let's dial up the illumination. Jitter's not great, but, uh, we have a rise time of 500-ish picoseconds. Now this is a 7850, or a 7B85, so it's a 400 megahertz plug-in, so... We have a very good rise time, and that's probably 
the rise time of the vertical on the 7904. So we have a 400, 400 megahertz of triggering, but we have a 500 megahertz vertical because of the frame. But we're not going through a plug-in, so we're going direct to the frame, so we get all the frame bandwidth. So that's probably uh, that's probably close to right because our crossing is here, and then we're point two. Point six divisions, so 600 picoseconds rise time on the, uh, and this isn't even the fast one. This is the, uh, this is the dash zero one. This isn't the dash zero two. So what else do we, uh, what other waveforms can this give us? Uh, there's some gain waveforms that are, That's the way it usually looks. So when you position these to adjust vertical gain. So if I set two of them to gain, which I'll do here in a second, actually, let me plug the other one in here. Like so. Always do that with the power off so you don't blow up the plug-ins. But if we go to B gain, and if we position the bright spots to the center like so, we get that dot pattern that can be used to align the grid. And this is to do the um, geometry in the orthogonal on the CRT. Very nice to do it this way as opposed to um, trying to get straight lines and things like that. So. Always want to do it this way if I can, but it does require two of the signal standardizers. You can't do it with just one. Uh, it's the same same gain and response circuits for triggering and all that other thing and, and all the other stuff. It's just a matter of what's doing the readout on the display. So you're balancing, essentially, you're standardizing the response across all of the plug all of the ports in the front of the in the front of the frame. So as you move plugins around, move plugins to other scopes. Everything stays within spec. Uh, let's go back to A. Let's see what frequency response might give us an interesting waveform. No, because that probably needs an external signal. Yeah, nothing's triggering. So it, it may need, uh, yeah, carrier, carrier in for frequency response. So it needs a um, SG503 signal or something in here where you can do um, and then you also have some amplitude adjustment on the frequency response too. So you can level the SG503, adjust this for whatever settings the calibration document's calling for, alignment document, um, and go from there. Well, thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at the quick presentation on the calibration and standardization plugins. I hope this, um, demystified what how I'm using these, what they're used for, and uh, what they're doing in the lab during some of the procedures that I've shown in other videos. As always, if there's any questions, comments below. I will see everybody there. As always, more is on the way, and I will see everybody in the next video.